Hello. In the Unit 2 lab, we're going to spend some time looking at uh, the corn to ethanol demonstration kit that I've got from the National Corn to Ethanol Research Center in Edwardsville, Illinois. Uh, they've given me permission to use this uh, in the course. I thought it would be useful for you to go through uh, this slide presentation prior to coming to the lab. If you have any questions, please bring them. Uh, they've got a real nice research facility down in Edwardsville. They actually have a pilot plant that they work on where they are able to change uh, different types of equipment or different enzymes uh, as they research the best way to uh, improve the ethanol process. This is a schematic of the corn ethanol process demonstration kit. Uh, it's, it's real simple to follow. Uh, in step one, this is the corn receiving. Corn is brought in, it's sent through a hammer mill. From the hammer mill, uh, the corn then will go to a slurry tank. In the slurry tank, we add alpha, alpha amylase uh, enzyme, about a third of it, into the slurry tank. From the slurry tank, uh, the slurry goes to the jet cooker. And from the jet, jet cooker, it goes into the liquefaction tank. In the liquefaction tank, we add uh, the rest of the alpha amylase enzyme. Then from the liquefaction tank, uh, the slurry goes into the fermentation tanks where we add uh, glucoamylase enzymes. Uh, the addition of yeast is done at this time the yeast are going to be converting the glucose to eth ethanol and also producing carbon dioxide. From the fermentation tanks, the product is now called beer. It's going to the beer well. From the beer well, it's going to go to the distillation system. From the distillation system, uh, we'll go uh, to the centrifuge, through the evaporators, through the dryer drum, and to the dried distillers, grains were soluble. But you'll notice that up here in the middle of the process, uh, the ethanol actually is pulled off here. It's 190 proof, goes through a molecular sieve, and then it goes into a storage tank uh, after it's had 5% gasoline added to it uh, as a de to denature it. So it's kind of a front end and back end here with the ethanol coming out in the middle and your co-product distiller dries, dried grains uh, coming out here at the end. From uh, kernel to ethanol, uh, the process takes approximately uh, 54 to 58 hours. The most time consuming process is going to be the fermentation. It's important to note that one bushel of corn weighs 56 pounds and it will yield approximately 2.8 gallons of ethanol, 17 pounds of carbon dioxide, and 17 pounds of dried distiller's grains with solubles. Midwest corn typically con contains, uh, a kernel of corn will contain 70 to 72 percent starch, 90 I'm sorry, 9% protein, 4% oils, and 9% fiber on a dry basis, plus approximately 15% of water. Uh, so corn is coming in, in, in this example, corn is being delivered at 15% moisture. Here's a picture of the bottom of the tanks. These are the hoppers. The corn kernels are milled uh, to a coarse flour and passed through a fine mesh screen uh, here in the hammer mill. The corn particle sizing is a compromise between uh, grinding fine enough to provide increased surface area to make starch granules available for reaction with water and enzymes, and leaving large enough particles for centrifuging out the solids at the end of the process for the dried distiller's grain. 
picture of a hammer mill. Also, the screen selection uh, will uh, kind of influence how fast the plant operates. From the hammer mill, the corn flour is uh, going through a slurry mixer with, uh, where it's mixed with hot water and alpha amylase enzyme. The resulting slurry is adjusted to a pH of 5.6 to 6.0 by either adding a, an acid or a base into the slurry tank. And notice the recycled water coming up here from the evaporator. So in a ethanol plant, they like to talk about zero discharge. They're trying to reuse all of the water that they are uh, generating. It's a picture of a slurry mixer. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, only one-third of the total alpha amylase is added in the slurry tank. Uh, the slurry tank, the temperature is maintained at 185 degrees Fahrenheit, a pH of 5.6 to 6.0, and the percent solids are about 32 percent. The remaining alpha amylase will be added later in the liquefaction tank. The slurry mash then goes through a jet cooker and then into a holding column. The slurry mash is heated to above 220 degrees Fahrenheit in the jet cooker using steam. And then when it exits, it goes into the holding column where it's going to be held for about five to 10 minutes. From the holding column, the slurry enters the liquefaction tank. And the, this tank is, uh, temperature is maintained at 185 degrees Fahrenheit, pH is 5.6 to 6.0, and the percent solids are 30%. Additional alpha amylase is added, and the mash is allowed to react for at least two hours. The jet cooking and liquefaction steps break apart the long starch molecules the shorter molecules are called dextrin. This is a picture of their portable enzyme cart. A second enzyme called glucoamylase is added to complete the dextrin breakdown to glucose. Glucose is converted by yeast, so here we're adding the yeast to the fermentation tanks through a series of multi-step reactions uh, creating eth ethanol and carbon dioxide. The temperature is 90 degrees Fahrenheit, pH of 4.0 to 5.0. Recently, many ethanol plants have started adding uh, the saccharifying enzyme glucoamylase directly to the fermentation tank in a process that's known as simultaneous saccharification and fermentation. Your fermentation tank. Carbon dioxide is the major co-product. And remember, for every bushel of corn, which is 56 pounds, we'll produce about 17 pounds of carbon dioxide gas. Yeast uh, can withstand extreme environmental stresses, including high ethanol concentrations as high as 12 to 18 percent by volume, as well as organic acids produced by contaminating bacteria. Fortunately, most bacterial contaminants do not grow below a pH of 4. Contaminating microorganisms can lower the yield by converting glucose to some undesirable fermentation products like fusel oils, acetic acid, and lactic acid. Antibiotics may be added to the fermentation process to minimize bacterial contamination. Also, the high heat in the jet cooker uh, helps uh, to remove uh, the bacteria. And the locations are going through quite a bit of cleaning uh, every day to maintain uh, low levels of bacteria. At the end of the fermentation, the product is called beer. It's going to contain 12% or higher concentration of ethanol, I think about 12 to 18%. The beer is typically stored in the tank referred to as the beer well. From the beer well, it's going to go to the distillation system. 
Here's a, a picture of the beer well. First, the beer is passed through a degassing column, which is the gray column here, to remove any residual uh, carbon dioxide and other gases. The separation of ethanol from water, uh, uh, from the non-converted solids mixture occurs here in the beer column, the blue column. These non-converted solids are, are whole stillage fall to the bottom and are sent to the centrifuge for separation. Further separation of the ethanol water mixture is accomplished using the rectifier column, the red column here. The 190 proof ethanol is sent through a molecular sieve column to convert it to 200 proof. It's a picture of the distillation system. Conventional distillation methods yield about 190 proof, uh, or what you call 95% pure ethanol, because ethanol and water form an azeotrope. An azeotrope is simply a mixture of two substances that form a constant boiling point mixture. Temperature is 280 degrees. The remaining 5% water is removed by molecular sieves, which rely on pore, pore sizes to separate the smaller water molecules from the ethanol. It's a picture of the molecular sieve. Finally, anhydrous, which is 100% or 200 proof ethanol, is denatured, typically with uh, approximately 5% gasoline to exempt the ethanol from beverage alcohol taxes. storage tank. The solids material remaining after distillation of ethanol from the beer column is called hold stillage. Hold stillage contains 7 to 10 percent solids and is composed primarily of non-fermentable materials and small particles of corn that did not get converted to ethanol. Uh, the hold stillage is separated in the centrifuge into wet cake and thin stillage. Wet cake is a more concentrated form of the whole stillage and contains approximately 35% solids after leaving the centrifuge. Since it contains mostly solids, it must be augered or conveyed to the drum dryer. Here's a picture of the centrifuge. The thin stillage is primarily water with between 5 and 4% solids. The thin stillage is evaporated down to a concentrated syrup in the evaporators. The condensed water is ultimately recycled and sent back to the slurry tank up in step three and helps to conserve total water usage. The remaining liquid is concentrated called syrup uh, by evaporation and is mixed with wet cake before entering the dryer. The syrup is approximately 28 to 35 percent solids and contains mostly proteins and oils from the corn. The addition of syrup e increases the nutritional value of the dried distiller's grains. Picture of the evaporator. Uh, the rotary uh, drum dryer, uh, the temperatures are running between 600 and 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, and the residence time here in the drum is about 30 minutes. The mixture of syrup and wet cake is dried to generate dried distiller's grains with syrup. DDGS is typically dried to 10% moisture level, which then can be shipped uh, long distances, uh, as opposed to a wet mill where the wet distiller's grains have to be used uh, immediately. In the dry grind process, corn is ground whole and fermented ethanol. The only major byproducts are ethanol, carbon dioxide, and dried distillers grains with solubles, which is sold as cattle feed. Thank you. If you have any questions, uh, please bring them to the lab session. Goodbye.